Hi, this is Katie from Queen's Podcast. Just a heads up, our show does include some strong language. So if you're uncomfortable with that, this might not be the show for you. Cheers, bitches. Hi, I'm Katie. And this is Nathan. And you're listening to Queen's, the podcast about badass women in history. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas, Nathan! Yes! Yes! (laughs) (laughs) Where's my goddamn apple cider with a little bit of rum in it? I know! Um, It's that time of the year again! Get your eggnog, girl! Do you like eggnog? (laughs) No, not really. I don't don't care for it. It's a little too thick. (laughs) It is thick! (laughs) I'm gonna give me the diabetes. Diabetes. All right, so today... <laughs> All right, so diabetes. So diabetes. <laughs> no, today we're here to talk about Jane Seymour, Ooh. who was the third wife of King Henry VIII of England. I do want to start with a disclaimer. Yeah, definitely. That, um, if you haven't listened to our two-part series on Catherine of Aragon or our two three-part series on Anne Boleyn, um, it would behoove you to do so before listening to this, unless you're already like a knowledge tutor file. Can you say behoove again? No. <laughs> that was a one time thing. <laughs> Damn it. Um, just because there was a lot of people that, you know, when I first started writing the outline, I like was reintroducing them and explaining who they are. And it took up a lot of time. And I was like, well, if you've already listened to those other episodes, you don't need me to tell you who Shapui or Cromwell are. Like, yeah. so just um, go back and listen to those if you haven't already. Um, or if you're not already like a tutor file and yeah. already know this stuff because yeah. it's like secondhand nature to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you're already, f- if you haven't listened to those episodes and you're already familiar with Henry VIII's court, then you don't need to go back and listen to them. But you should because they're good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We'd like I, to say so ourselves. If I do say so myself. <laughs> so yeah, Jane Seymour. So Nathan, what's our Jane Seymour drink? Okay, so Nathan made his own little creation. So I looked up like an old fashioned, uh-huh. and I was like, "I'm not feeling whiskey because Nathan's I like old whiskey." Old but... fashioned because Jane is old fashioned. Yeah, she's okay. a little bit old fashioned. Okay, I think she was Henry VIII's old fashioned wife. Okay, um, she she liked. We'll get into it. She liked yeah. her needlework and her like running the house. So she was very much like the mom with the pearls on. That yeah, probably vacuum. I can see that totally. Yeah, but so I took an old fashioned, but I made it with vodka, and I. I want to say I watered it down because we are doing a podcast and, and we have to talk for a while and yeah. you do get thirsty and then you realize that you're drinking alcohol. So yes, yes, yes. So I took a shot of vodka and then I did about a half a shot of blood orange liqueur because, mm. you know, she might have a little blood on her hands. Just, she might. She just, might. Just, just a little bit we'll of We'll get blood. to it. <laughs> did that and then... Uh, Took a cherry out. So the original recipe that I wanted to do was with pomegranate mm-hmm. because of Catherine of Aragon. Yeah. Um, because we'll get into that a little bit later, she too. She in with Catherine as she well. She was the lady yeah. in waiting. So I wanted to do the pomegranate seeds, but God damn it, H-E-B, I love you so much. But you didn't have pomegranate. I guess it's not in season. H-E-B is a Texas grocery store. Yeah. And we are very big fans. H-E-B, if you would like to be a sponsor of Queen's Podcast. <laughs> Hit me up. Please reach out. Um, <laughs> yeah, slide so onto my DMs. Slide into our DMs. <laughs> um, oh, cool. Well, let's let's give it a taste. Yes. It's got a little club soda, too, okay. to water it down. Oh, that's nice. Because I'm not, I'm not a fan of old fashions because they're just too, they, they're just too hard to drink they're for me. They're too boozy. And so this, uh, I like it watered down. And I can taste, because um, sometimes blood orange is a little bit overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And it's just enough a hint of blood orange. Work, Nathan, so, work. All right. So we've got our make, booze. I know how to make my cocktails. <laughs> mm, we've got our booze. So before we jump into the story of Jane Seymour, let's do some shout outs. Patreon shout outs. All right. So first we want to start with... Um, a tier of ladies who just have decided to go above and beyond and pay beyond what our Patreon asking was for. And we call them our queen mothers. So thank you to Amber, Ashley, Charity, Delania, Heather, Lizzie, and Natalie. Thank you, girls. Thanks, girls. 
All right, Nathan, will you please shout out our Empress supporters? Don't mind if I do. Um, Aaron, Alex, Amanda, Anastasia, Angelica, Annette, April, Ashley, Brianna, Brendan, Brett, Brooks, Cadence, Caitlin, Krista, Claire, Deanna, Eleanor, Aaron, Genevieve, Isabel, Jackie, Jamie, Jared, Jessica B, Jessica B, Jessica S. What? <laughs> All the Jessicas. Yes. Jody, Joshua, Kate, Kathy, Kaylee, Kelly F, Kelly H, Kelly H. Ke- All the Kellys. All too. the Kellys. Yes. Kevin, Kiana, Christy, Kim, Lana, Lauren, Liotta, Maddie, Mariah, Maureen, C, Maureen L. <laughs> Piper, Rachel, Rebecca, Rowena, Samantha, Sarah, L, Sandra, Sophie, Spencer, Stephanie, N, Stephanie, O, Taylor, L- Taylor, Tiffany, Tracy, and Yen. All right. Thank you to those lovely people. And now I'd like to give a shout out to our all of our Queen Concerts, Consort supporters. <laughs> yeah, they're concert mm. supporters. Abigail, Adelaide, Alexandra, Alexandra L., Allison, Alyssa, Amanda, Anne, Ashley, Audrey, Augusta, Barry, uh, Brittany, Brianna, Callie, Charlotte, Chelsea, uh, Chelsea M and Chelsea R, Christina, Claire, Cody, Danny, Danny N, Danielle, Daphne, Deanna, Diana, Emily, Emma, Erica, Haley, Helene, Jamie, Jara, Jessica, Jose, Julie, Carla, Kat, Kayla, Kaylee, Kristen, Christina, Kylie, Lori, Lauren, Lauren S., Linda, Lindsay, Maya, Megan, Melanie, Melissa, Natalie, Nicolette, Peggy, Raina, Retta, Roxana, Sarah, Shannon, Shauna, Cheryl Lee, Taylor, Taylor S., Terry, Toby, and Valerie. Thanks, Patreon supporters. And thank you to all of our supporters at every level. And yes. just anybody that thanks for listening, even if you don't want to pay us. That's fine. Yeah, we yeah. do it for free anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Patreon people just get a little extra bonus content. Yeah. That's yeah. It. That's what it is. All right. So you are you ready to jump into the life of... Let's do it. Because this one is kind of a doozy because it plays off the back of two of our other episodes. Yeah. Yeah. It's um. It was really interesting to research her whenever... Um, I posted on Facebook, you know, that this was going to be our next subject. We got a lot of people just being like, oh, how boring. And, um, and I mean, she's definitely compared to some of the other women we've covered um, less exciting. But I think I think she's so misrepresented in history. I do, too. I think a lot of what happened with her was kind of just lost because she just she she, she had a very, very short life. She, yeah, she had and, a very short time in the spotlight. And I don't think a lot of what happened with her was documented. Yeah. So and so maybe like, that was purposely by Henry VIII. We don't know. Yeah. But let's dive right on in to so, Jane Seymour. Absolutely. Jane was born sometime around 1508, probably. Yeah. And her family was pretty prominent. They, they weren't like dukes or anything, but they were minor nobility. Yeah. You know, they had their shit together. Though her father and then her brothers all worked for high ranking members in the English court and they were far from poor. Oh, yeah. And they were like a really old family. Like they their um, family actually came over with William the Conqueror. Oh. But at that point, they were called St. Maur was their last name. Okay. I don't know if I'm saying that right. M-A-U-R. So whenever they came we're over. with it. Yeah. When they came over from France, they were St. Maur. And just over the generations, it became Seymour. Because nice. that's easier to say. So yeah. guess who she was cousins with? Anne Boleyn was her <laughs> second cousin. So her... Their mothers were first cousins. Yes. So they're like distant second cousins. But everybody in the nobility is fucking cousins. So <laughs> it, they didn't see each other at family reunions or anything. No, like, no, definitely not. Definitely, yeah. definitely, yeah, definitely, yeah. Definitely, yeah. So she grew up on a manor called Wolf Hall. 
It wasn't like the biggest manor in England, but again, they aren't like these impoverished poor people yeah. living in this. They're still. It was still a pretty cush life. Yeah, by 16th century standards. Yeah, she grew up with her siblings, and it appears all of the children were pretty close. And unlike many families of nobility, they didn't really send off their children to go get educated, like, like a, a different court or like with a different family. They kept them all at home until they were old enough to i think her brother went and started his service at court when he was like 15 oh so he stayed at home until then yeah that's still really fucking young (laughs) but back in 15 it was i was like 15 time to be a man yeah right time to go to war (laughs) oh my gosh i was like what play am i gonna be in (laughs) um so to mention all of her siblings names would take too long, and most of them don't really play a huge part in this. Yeah, some of them died really young, but, like, the ones that lived into adulthood, it was, like, what, four sisters and three brothers? I think it was the other way around. Four brothers and three sisters. But still, to have, like, eight children make it to adulthood, that was... Mama's a fertile myrtle, bitch. She's a fertile myrtle, (laughs) and just that was, like... Not always common. It wasn't. No, we talked wasn't, about so many women that have had miscarriage after miscarriage, and, and it wasn't guaranteed that your children would survive the first year of their life. Mm-hmm. So that she, they, this family had eight. They were very lucky. Yeah, yeah. very, 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 very lucky. So her education, if we're going to compare it to other women that we've talked about, uh, I would, I would, I would grade it a hard meh. <laughs> <laughs> It's very true. It's yeah. very true. Like compared to like Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn. Yeah. Hello. Who like, who like were raised at like court and given like the best education money could buy. And they the were time. also taught like to speak a bunch of different languages because you maybe had to speak to the ambassador of yeah. France or speak to the king yeah. of Spain. And they, and they were like, well, Jane's gonna marry a knight you know so like a best case maybe she's gonna marry a baron yeah or something so what's like that. the point so there's no reason to teach these girls how to speak other languages or to understand like different cultures or anything like yeah that. but don't get it twisted she did know how to read and write yeah and she did but not in latin yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay touche touche <laughs> um she learned needlework which mm-hmm. was something that would have been very common for a social yeah it was like at the if time you were to gonna do. host people, you were expected to like have like either a reading circle for like biblical readings or um, needlework circle yeah. for the ladies when they came over. Needlework circle, yeah, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, some circle work. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like a circle jerk. Yes, that's what I was... <laughs> you didn't need to say it; it was implied. But there we go. Nathan had to go there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she also um, was, she would have learned some kind of music because women were expected to like know it a little bit, but she wasn't a necessarily talented musician. No. Um, but she did, she was a pretty good horse rider. Um, she loved yeah. to hunt. Yeah. So all in all, just kind of like a country education, like run in a household, learn to sew, learn to hunt. Yeah, yeah, like the trailer park version of Catherine of Aragon. Sure. <laughs> I wouldn't have used those words, but sure. Sure. So what did she look like, Katie? Well, we know the facts, um, but the aesthetics are up for debate. Mm-hmm. We know she was blonde with very light complexion and light eyes. And at the time, on paper, that's considered like the abs- the beauty the, standard yeah the english beauty the english the rose as they would call oh, it like Lord. a it was like a fair skin fair hair um quiet demure woman so <laughs> she checks all these boxes um but we'll get it to it a little bit later i don't know if we could necessarily um describe her as beautiful okay that's yeah. fair no it's fair i mean if yeah. you look up pictures you're like oh okay Okay. Yeah, we'll get more into that later. But I, I, um, on paper, she was the standard of beauty, but dot, dot, dot. Okay. Okay. So there is some scandal. So if this happened, it's a huge fucking scandal. Yeah. It's still debated whether this actually happened or not, though. Okay. Her eldest brother's name was Edward, and he was married to a lady named Catherine. So 
we don't know what really happened. This is all kind of just he said, she said bullshit. But it's still a juicy story, girl. Yes. So Catherine's father died in 1527. And she was supposed to inherit all this shit because her parents didn't have any sons. But instead, he added to his will that Catherine nor her children should inherit anything from his estate. Okay. Okay. That part, obviously, is definitely a fact because it's all written down and that's who you inherit your shit from because yeah. that's in his will. So that's all and like so, that. And so, scandal, like the rumor mill started. What did just, Catherine do what, to get yeah. like written out of the will? It oh my God, horrible. scandal. And she ends up going into a nunnery. So even more like... Like soon after he died, soon after the will came out and she realized she wasn't getting anything, she went into a nunnery. And it's like... Married women didn't just become nuns. No. I mean, sometimes it would happen, like, whenever they... I mean, I guess it wasn't completely unheard of, or but it was more like when your husband died. Yeah, it's like when your husband dies and you're, like... And a, you're not wanting to get remarried. Exactly. Or something, you might go into a nunnery. But, um... So, it was like, well, what the fuck happened that her dad wrote her, wrote her out of the will, and then she joins... Uh, Drama. And so, <laughs> the, the rumor that has survived to this day is that Catherine was having an affair with Edward and Jane's own father. Oh my god, this is like, oh my god. No. And <laughs> Edward didn't believe that their children together were actually his, but they were basically his brothers. Girl, they, this, they were <laughs> this sounds like some Maury Povich shit. Like, oh, my oh. my daddy's the father of my children. Yes. Like, my yes. children are actually my brothers. Can you <laughs> imagine if this is true? Again, we have no way to, like, back up. That's just a rumor that survived yes. to this day. And we, we, and what's really sad about, like, all of this is that all we have on her life is just, like, Rumors and it's a lot of rumors. Not not a lot it's written a lot of down. Hearsay. Yeah, we don't really know a whole lot about her life until she showed up at court sometime between fifteen twenty seven and fifteen thirty two. She was in the service of Catherine of Aragon at the time. Yeah. Um, it's assumed that Jane probably served in some other capacity before becoming a lady in waiting to the queen. Because you don't just you don't just come from obscurity and become a lady in waiting to the queen. No. She probably she probably either my assumption is that she served probably in somebody else's household first, like a duchess or something. Oh, and mo- moving on up. And then, like, the duchess was like, well, I don't need her anymore, but I need to, I want to find something for her to do because she's a really good lady-in-waiting or whatever. Hey! And then, like, promoted her up. Make it That's sense. my assumption. Yeah. But we do know at the time, whenever in, by 1532, when Jane joined Catherine's household, Catherine... Like, the, the Anne Boleyn scandal was already in full force yeah. at this point. And Catherine was looking for ladies of wait, in waiting who were going to be quiet yeah. <laughs> and not cause any scandal and not be flashy. So, well, I mean, can you blame Catherine at the same point? Absolutely Being not. like, uh, I don't and want so, any drama. No, 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 no drama. Jane Seymour was like, well, I am quiet and certainly not flashy. Mm-hmm. And I do not want any more drama in my life. Um, I think I'd be a perfect candidate. And Catherine was like, you know what? I think you would too. You're hired. You're hired. (laughs) So um, something I'd never really thought about before doing this research, um, Anne and all of the other Henry VIII's mistresses were all noted to be chosen like for, like, um, like for instance, you know how Anne Boleyn and caught Henry's eye when she was like in this play. Oh yeah, they were very spectacle. And yeah, she, she played like perseverance or yeah. something. Like she played a role. Jane was never asked to be in any of these pageants. Jane was never mm. like um, the lady at a dance, at like at a ball or whatever, with the full card. Um, you know, she. That's probably. What started her to kind of have this um, plain Jane, like, um, persona. But I also wonder if it's because she was serving with Catherine of Aragon and um, the king was spending... There was basically two queens and two queen's courts at this point. Catherine's and Anne's. And Henry was more camping out at the Anne camp. So maybe she was never invited to be in a pageant because... 
Catherine of Aragon wasn't just going to throw these pageants if the king's not even there. Yeah, you they know? didn't have pageants. Yeah, and her. she wasn't throwing balls by herself, so, yeah. Uh, just side note, where did the name Plain Jane come from? Because I feel like it should be Jane Seymour. I mean, that's what, every, <laughs> that's what a lot of people call her. Like, that's kind of like a, a nickname. But, like, where know? did Plain Jane come from? Do you think Maybe she originated? I yeah. I think it's, it's just the, the words rhyme. <laughs> and we are a simple people. Okay, you being real. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be because she maybe she wasn't in these plays because she was a plain Jane. Or maybe she just never got asked. Yeah. Nobody yeah. ever was like, hey, yo, you want to be in this play? This because she was at, cause she was at the court of Catherine of Aragon, which was not a flashy. And yeah, she's yeah. super young, too. So she hasn't had like Mm-mm. a lot of life she's not experience. That young. She's not that young. At this point, she's like 24. Yeah, but still that's... I mean, no, but by then, the, by then, those standards. No, that's not young. That's yeah, old. back back then, that was she's not a young. Hag. She's an old hag. Well, I mean, she was starting to get worried that she was gonna be. God, I would be ancient. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, at this time, um, Catherine lived at Richmond Palace, which was maybe about a mile and a half from where Anne Boleyn and Henry had their court at Greenwich Palace. Uh, but it's important to note that the first couple of years that Jane is at you know, a, a lady in waiting, um, she's not seeing the king on a regular basis. No, he's not really visiting Richmond because, yeah. again, he's with, he's not seeing Catherine of Aragon. Yeah, they had, he's with Anne Boleyn. They had ended their physical relationship ages ago. Yeah. So. Jane does have some connections at the court, though. Yeah. That would have, you know, helped her get a real job. Mm-hmm. Her brother Edward had been working at court for over a decade by the time Jane just brought son up to the court. And he's working for this little guy uh, called Thomas Cromwell. Maybe you've heard of him. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But no, if you have listened to our other two Henry VIII's queens, you've definitely heard of Thomas Cromwell. He's um, Henry VIII's like, right-hand dude. So the fact that her brother is in service of the king's right-hand dude... Um, probably really helped her get her position that she was in. And then there was this other guy named Francis Bryan. And um, he is second cousins to the Seymours, which means he was also second cousins to the Boleyns. Because they're all related. But he actually liked the Seymours. Oh. He had always taken like this special interest. in like He probably had a hand in getting... Edward the job with Thomas Cromwell. Yeah, and uh, Francis was pretty good buddies with the king, mm-hmm, too. Mm-hmm. So he probably put in a good word with somebody, uh, you know, to get Edward and Jane their places in court. Totally. And he was like, okay, look, Jane, you're 24. It's 16. It's the 16th century. You you're may, a hag. You may as well be 73. <laughs> you are too old to not be married and so he starts, he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to solve this for you. And so he starts looking around for a husband for Jane. Um, yeah, because un, unmarried ladies at court, the only reason they're there are to find husbands. Okay, so not to be ugly, but really don't think Jane was this good looking woman by today's standards or the standards of yesteryear. Yeah, because she was in her mid 20s and she hadn't had any even hints of proposals. But maybe that's because she's like super shy and she doesn't, isn't really outgoing. But wasn't that supposed to be like the ideal wife at the time? Like a quiet and demure. Touche. And like if you compare it to um, Anne Boleyn, who her first few, few years at English court, she was having Thomas Wyatt write poets about her, poems uh, about her, right, right. and then, um, you know, having dukes, like, going against their parents' wishes and proposing to her. But you did, like, Son of a duke. we did say that her family had this horrible reputation, though, yeah. because of that whole scandal. Yeah, so, so maybe, but... Also, that plays into it. But her younger sister, Elizabeth, was already married. Okay. Which makes me go, because like, they're like, oh, well, maybe the Seymours didn't really have enough money for a dowry. And then it's like, well, then how did... It sounds this... like there's a lot of excuses. It for, sounds for like she Jane, probably but... just wasn't considered to be a catch. Yeah. She's not from this... She's not particularly good looking. She's not from a super connected family. So she just kept getting passed up. And also, if you look at her, her um, Hans Holbein portrait, mm. I just don't think she's cute. No, she. I mean, she. She has a schnoz. Um, schnoz? No, it's not her nose. It's kind of like her chin. It's just everything. And she just kind of looks like kind of like 
I but also that I, like headgear though doesn't help. But yeah, that doesn't really help. No. She may look completely different without the headgear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we don't think she was particularly cute, but maybe she was really funny or something. So she's she's no Anne Boleyn though. Yeah. At this time, it's likely that they served together at court though. They definitely knew Funny each other. Funny thing. Yeah. Uh, there's no record of them like actually having met or being friends. They definitely would have met. I mean, there's no record of it, but they were both ladies in waiting at court. Yeah. There's no record, but they would have been at court at the same time. But th- there's nothing saying that they were friends or not. But I'm I'm pretty sure they knew of each other and probably yeah. talked many of times. Yeah, and they were, um, I believe, cordial to each other while they were both ladies in waiting. Yes. And um. Um, yeah, but while Jane was working for Catherine, she develops this um, real devotion to Catherine of Aragon. Yeah. She just views her as the perfect queen, um, pious, and stands up for what she believes in. And um, yeah, she's just like, she's she is team Catherine 115%. Which I mean, I can be down with. Yeah, and Team Catherine. Come on now, she's a cool, she's a cool chick. Yeah. So Jane does actually have one short-lived first engagement. So remember Francis Bryan. So he arranges an engagement with a man named William Dormer. The engagement was short-lived and led to absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, William's parents were super not into it from the get-go, and they only agreed to it because Francis Bryan's close relationship with the king, and you know, that might benefit me somehow, yeah. which, you know, entertaining the idea. Yes. But William was an only child, so his parents were like, look, if we had more kids, sure, we'd just like throw one of the guys away to appease Francis Bryan, but... We just have this one boy, so we got to make this shit count. Got to make it count. Um, Later on, Jane got word that William was actually engaged to someone else. And there's no documentation on how she would have taken this. But how would you have taken that? Yeah, not good. It must have been, like, let's put ourselves in her shoes real quick. She's in her mid-twenties. Her younger sister has already been married for a minute. And she's here, an old maid, at the ripe old age of, what, 24? 24, 25. (laughs) The one and only man that's ever showed remote interest in her has now dumped her for a better prospect. I am not feeling good for Jane right now. (laughs) I'm I'm thinking she's mortified. Yeah. Depressed. Yeah. Feeling super bad about herself. How could you not? I mean, again, we don't know. Maybe this dormer guy was like a super dud and she was relieved, but I have a feeling that it it was not a happy time. Yeah, she's not feeling like she's on top of the world, girl. And to make things worse, her beloved mistress was undergoing the biggest disgrace in christendom yes i mean even today (laughs) her husband was breaking from the catholic church just to divorce her in case you haven't heard (laughs) and once henry the eighth had broken from the church and declared his own marriage to catherine invalid (sighs) she was sent to fuck off to like um ye old dusty castle (laughs) and had like her entire staff pretty much stripped from her yep so, um, Catherine is being physically forced away from her only living child, her daughter Mary, sent off to just, you know, just die in obscurity. Yeah. And Separated I just, from your child. Fucking yes. depressing. So, I imagine that while Jane was in Catherine's service, she would have seen this, like, absolute anguish that Catherine was in. And I think that stuck with Jane. Oh, absolutely. Like, you don't just like because she I respected think, her think, so much. To be to be fair to Jane, I think everything that happens in this sequence of events stuck with Jane. Yeah, but <laughs> I think that I think this um, witnessing this just um, Angus, really your child is being really separated from you. You're being banished away from Disgraced. your child, your family. Everybody hates you. Blah 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 blah. Like awful. Yeah, and that was her girl. Like, yeah. So Catherine doesn't get to say like who and her staff gets to stay. Um, so Jane probably wanted to stay with Catherine, but at the same time, they're like, okay, we're slimming down her staff, so you got to stay here. She was like, cool, so I don't have to go away to this really far off. I don't off. have to go to ye old Dusty Castle? <laughs> yes, ye old Dusty Castle. And they're like, Castle. no, we're sending you to the service of the new queen, 
Anne Boleyn. I just had a great merch idea. What? <laughs> Panties that say ye old dusty castle oh on the God. front. Oh, my God. had a merch idea Sorry. coming to etsy store queen's podcast etsy store soon <laughs> panties ye old dusty cats. i love it <laughs> sorry i genuinely oh, love it i just literally had a little ding light bulb moment <laughs> anyway so they were like um hey you're gonna go work for the new queen Anne right now and i feel like jane probably was conflicted about it because i don't think she was Anne's number one fan because yeah. of what she saw happen to Catherine of aragon yeah but I think, I mean, for the last few years, she's been at a quiet court with no husband prospects. And drinking beer. <laughs> Possibly drinking beer, because we know that that's about the time that uh, Catherine Aragon started enjoying her Welsh beer. Yeah, so lots of Jesus prayers, sewing, and beer. Yeah, which I think, I mean, I'm sure Jane likes, but I'm sure she was ready for a faster pace. Yeah, she yeah. wanted a real court life. Yeah. And now she's with Anne, she's attending all these balls and parties, and there's all these... It's handsome, just a completely different Yeah, atmosphere. there's all these handsome men's all around. All around. She's ready to go. She's ready to pounce. Oh. <laughs> so, in 1533, she's now a lady, lady-in-waiting to Anne Boleyn. Um, it must have been weird to her, like, kind of just having this completely different shift in lifestyle. Um, her actual job description, however, would have been mostly the same. You know, helping her get helping her get dressed, just helping her with whatever she needed. Um, but I have to imagine that um, she resents Anne Boleyn more than a little bit. Yeah, because she probably has a little bit of a bad taste in her mouth. And also, later on, um, the Spanish ambassador, Chapuis, wrote that... Um, Jane was of no quick wit, but may have some understanding. So I feel like, because just Anne Boleyn was so famous for her big fucking mouth and like how witty and quick Mm -hmm. she was. And I feel like Anne probably felt like a deer in the headlights trying to keep up with that because she wasn't raised to. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jane probably felt like a deer in the headlights. What would the 16th century equivalent of headlights be? (laughs) Deer in the torchlight? Yes, in the torchlight. (laughs) Trying to keep up with um, just the witty banter because she wasn't raised that way. And that's not something she experienced in her previous court life. Yeah. So she probably looked kind of dumb by comparison, which yeah. isn't fair. I don't think she was dumb. No, not at all. She just wasn't used to this. No, no. It wasn't her nature. <laughs> Absolutely not. She goes unnoticed for a for quite a few years. Yeah. She just kind of flies under the radar. So from 1533 to 1536, we don't really have any record of Jane at this time. And what she was up to besides yeah. just being a lady in waiting. Yeah, to Anne Boleyn, but there's no record of any sort of drama, any sort of... Suitors, unfortunately. Yeah, nothing that's really there. But here are a couple of things that happened while she was at court. So Anne's coronation... Mm-hmm. She would have walked behind her as a lady and a lady of honor at the coronation. She would have also been there for the birth of Anne's first child, Elizabeth. Maybe, Maybe you've heard of her. <laughs> and she would have been there during the birth. Like she probably, probably helped, yeah. you know, clean up and be part of the birth of, and get the towels or whatever. Yeah, grab. Yeah, I think somebody once emailed us um, saying that like. No, unmarried ladies didn't actually attend the actual, like, labor because Ooh. they didn't want to scare them off from getting married and having kids of their own. But well, that's she, fair. So if that's true, though, she still would have attended Anne during her, like, confinement or whatever. Yeah. yeah. She would have been there during that, that weird fucking 16th century confinement. Oh, we've, done, we've covered that before, ladies I and mean, gentlemen. I mean, if there was Netflix, I feel like confinement wouldn't be that bad. But there no. was no Netflix. <laughs> so what do you do? You just read the Bible and stare at the ceiling like yep, all day? Like, that sounds like Katie's hell. <laughs> oh my God. I would be so, I would have such cabin fever. Oh. <laughs> so Jane also would have, during this 1533 to 1536 time, her brother Edward got married. So For a second time. Again. He got married again. And he, she would have gone off and attended that wedding. Yeah, I wonder if their father attended that wedding. 
Drama. Drama. In 1535, Henry VIII's court went on summer progress. And this is a turning point in Jane's story. I think we've mentioned uh, the tradition of progress before in our other podcast. It's basically episodes. just all of the <coughs> courtiers and the king and the queen and all their ladies in waiting and privy council, just like everybody just gets on their horses and leaves London. And it's, they do it for several reasons. One, so the, the, the castle, the palace in London needs to be cleaned. <laughs> it's really nasty. It's really nasty. They don't it understand. It is a ye old dusty castle. <laughs> if, if by 1500s standards they thought it was dirty. That's got to be nasty. It, it, it must have smelled. Um, <laughs> and so they do that so that they can, you know, clean and replenish and everything. And they also do it so the king and queen can be seen. Because, um, you know, like people... That, it's like a PR tour. Kind of. Like, because I mean... It's like, nobody knows what you look like. They've never been around you. Yeah. So, so it's a way to just connect. the peasants. The peasants can come out and see the royal progress yeah. drive by and wave and like a parade or something. Yeah. And because, you know, people that lived um, like a day or two horse ride away, if they're not... Um, like of the nobility, they never leave their town. Yeah, they're never going to see the king. Yeah, of so fucking it was a way to be seen. So, and they would go from um, castle to castle of people in the nobility. So, you know, couch surfing. Ye old couch surfing. Ye old couch surfing. <laughs> we got to drop the ye old. It's getting, yeah. <laughs> it is getting ye old. <laughs> it was a huge honor. For the royal court to come to your place. Of course it would be. And also it would be a huge expense. Oh my God. If the king came they, to your place. They could go bankrupt. There are stories yeah. of like people going bankrupt from having the court come and stay at their place. I would progress. not. Bl- like, I it's mean, a lot of people to feed. And the king is not known for his frugal tastes. Uh, no. Yeah. He, he gets a little bit boozy. So, in 1535, the Seymours are asked to host um, a stay on the Royal Progress at Wolf Hall. And this is huge. Huge. This this is very huge. They were probably chosen because, uh, at the time, her brother Edward was now working for Thomas Cromwell, and Cromwell was really fond of Edward. Yeah, he. Re- I think he saw a lot of promise in him, and I think Cromwell was really smart about... Um, well, I'm going to promote the people that I think are going to be loyal to me. So the Seymours and Cromwell are kind of tight knit. Yeah. And so this is when all the romantic stories go about when Henry first met Jane. Or first noticed her, at least. Yeah. I'm sure they would have met before. But um, it's certainly possible that this could have been when Henry first became interested in Jane. Um because she was never front and center at Hampton Court. Yeah. And so she was um, more recognized here at her own home. Yeah, because her duty at home would have been to be the hostess and to like be... Well, no, actually, mm. whenever she... She was there as a lady-in-waiting to her queen still. So the ho- job of being the hostess would have been her mother's job. Oh, nice fact check, Katie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She would have still had all of her regular duties for being lady-in-waiting. But, I mean, when it's your home, you're going to, you know, and your whole family's getting introduced to the king, you probably get pulled in a couple of times, you know. Yeah. So, um... So that's why some people don't think this is when their romance started, because she would have, it would have just been a regular day for her serving the queen. But it definitely is sometime, either at this time or within the next few months, when the, when Henry noticed her. She caught the eye of the king. Mm-hmm. I believe that the Seymours, after having their successful hosting during progress, were just, you know, in the king's favor at the time. Yeah, they were just um, noticed. Yeah. Like, he was like, you know, I've never really thought about the Seymour family before, but that was a really good stay. They showed me a good time. Um, yep. I want to learn more about that. I want to see yeah. them around more. They, they yeah. had a nice party, so yeah. this is cool. Yeah, and we have no idea for sure. But what I think is that Cromwell noticed that Henry was starting to have a wandering eye away from Anne Boleyn. And Cromwell, like I said earlier, was really good about promoting people he thought they were going to be loyal to him. Mm-hmm. And he's like... Okay, these Seymours already owe me for getting them on the royal progress list. 
So if I put one of the Seymour girls in front of the king, then they'll never turn against me if I give them that kind of favor. Well, I mean, it sounds like a likely argument. Yeah. So we don't know exactly when Henry officially had his hots for Jane, but it was sometime between September 1535 and before January 1536. Um, see, Anne Boleyn by that time had had one girl and one miscarriage, and the king was not in love with her as he was he, before. He, he was still, I mean, he, there was definitely no talk of setting Anne aside at this point. But his eye was a wandering. It was a wandering. he was being a little bit of a creep, like TLC. Yes. And so when the Seymours and Cromwell put Jane in his line of vision, I don't think they were, ha- they ever dreamed that they were trying to make her queen or anything. No, but a mistress at the time, if you were a mistress, you would have a lot of power and you yeah. could get a lot of shit done. Yeah. Because bitches get shit done. And all of Henry's other, like, mistresses of note, um, like, Bessie Blount, like, after he was done with her, he gave her a husband. Yeah. He gave her a husband she, a pretty decent a, standing. Yeah, she had a nice castle and she had a nice Yeah, life. she had a house and she had, and so it was like, if I mean... And then also, you know, you do favors for the family of your favorite mistress or whatever, too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they were like, I think that at this point, Cromwell was like, let's put Jane in front of him and kind of coach her on how to get his attention. And I think this is where Jane gets her reputation. Yeah, because he was like telling, you know, they were coaching her being like, be the exact opposite of Anne Boleyn. Which, I mean, she's learning from her circumstances. She learns from Catherine of Aragon, and she's learning from Anne Boleyn and, like, oh, yeah. her shit. Uh, and that's did... why I think she's she is more clever than we give her. Agreed. Like, Agreed. She, she wasn't just like, a dur, what? You know, she saw what was going on. She saw what happened to the other women at court. Um, and so whenever they were like... Um, hey, you need to be the exact opposite of Anne Boleyn. Yeah, so... She was like, well, I already look exactly opposite of Anne Boleyn. So that works. So I'm just going to lean even harder into this quiet, demure attitude. Yeah, because Anne is, like, loud and obnoxious. She would never keep her big, sexy mouth shut. She would never keep her big, sexy mouth shut. And And Jane would be like, OMG, I love being quiet and demure. (laughs) I love being quiet. It's my favorite. (laughs) (laughs) And was Protestant, and I don't think uh, at this time Jane would ever be like openly like, "Hey, I'm Catholic," because <laughs> that she didn't want to get her head cut off. Yeah, but she definitely sympathized with Catholicism. Yeah, so yeah, it's um, possible that it's possible that Henry and her had this flirty little relationship at the time, but nothing serious. Yes, nothing, nothing major. Yeah. So, Anne Boleyn gets pregnant again in 1535, (coughs) and then in early 1536, Catherine of Aragon passes away. And, again, we have no record of how Jane took Catherine's passing. But, honestly, we kind of know. Put yourself in her shoes. Yeah, we've got context clues. (laughs) when, When Catherine died, Anne and Henry wore yellow. To celebrate. I don't think Jane I don't think Jane happy about that. I don't think Jane was happy about that at all. She was not in a place of power to say say anything. anything. Yeah. So we have no record, but I'm sure she was just like the fucking disrespect. But she wouldn't have put that on the king. She would have put that all on Anne. One honey. Because everybody in the country, if they were uh, upset about anything in the country, they put it on Anne. Because you didn't want to get killed yeah you don't don't want to blame the king because you'll get killed yeah yeah you gotta blame his wife so i'm sure whenever she saw them in yellow on the day of catherine of aragon's death they she was just like fuck this bitch Mm -hmm. you know but anne's triumph at the time and jane's obscurity were both about to change the joust that changed the world (laughs) so henry still thinks he's like big dick energy and but he's in this like mid to late forties, so he's bordering on fragile dick energy. Yeah, and um, he throws a joust and gets knocked to the ground and is out cold for two fucking hours. Long story short, 
when he woke up, when he woke up, he was a changed man. For those that listen to our Agrippina the Younger episode, we see a lot of similarities in what happened with Caligula. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever he, he got sick, basically, and then came out of came it, out of it, and he's like, and then he's Caligula, crazy. Yeah. So basically, Anne had a miscarriage, and Henry bumped his head, and the British Caligula was born. Yes, yes. He he started the joust as a. Um, handsome dashing king and woke up as british caligula all aboard the crazy train so after anne had her or yeah after anne had her miscarriage henry zoned in on jane hard oh yeah tunnel vision is an understatement totally there was a story that they portray in the tutors (laughs) on showtime where anne walks in on jane sitting on henry's lap and sees her, like, grinding on that D. And it's like, oh, my God, I had a miscarriage because I'm Anne Boleyn. That is a fabrication. Yeah, the lady, a little bit of a stretch, guys. The lady that um, told that story, like, and got it in circulation wasn't even born yet at this time. Ooh. So it's almost certainly not real. But they are definitely flirting. And Henry's like, I'm moving in on this chick. And so he starts writing her letters and pursuing her. And, sending, and so... One day. <laughs> Sorry, I had a little <laughs> chuckle with the story we're about to tell. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, one day, um, and this is like the first thing that's like Jane's first big recorded story, um, that this definitely happened. She receives a letter from Henry with um, a purse and money, and there's like money in the purse. So, there's this dude named Nicholas Carew, and Nikki C., is um, fucking hates Anne Boleyn and is like really close in the king's gang. So Nikki C runs up and he's like, yo, 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 baby girl. Um, <laughs> let me tell you how you need to handle this situation. Yeah. So Jane's official reaction when she got the gift of money was bit much. <laughs> that, that is an understatement. Like this bitch throws herself to the ground and pleads in front of the king's messengers that she's, I'm just a gentle woman, and all I have in this world is my honor. And she kisses the envelope and doesn't open it, and kisses the, the purse and doesn't open it, and gives it back and says, um, the king can make me a gift of money when I've made an honorable marriage. Hint, hint. Hint, 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 hint. Bitch, marry me, ho. <laughs> so... We here at Queen's Podcast call that <laughs> Bolinning. She Bolined ho hard, guys. She Bolined her little ass off. Because this is exactly what Anne did. But when, just like with Anne, when the king hears of Jane's response, he's like... Boner city. Boner alert. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. Boner he just, alert. He just likes when women turn him down. He likes the chase. Like, that's, yeah. He likes the chase. And... Yeah, I think this shows... I think this shows this. she wasn't as pious as everyone likes to pretend like she was. no, she was not. I think it shows that she was down to play the game. She was like, this is my fucking moment in the sun. I have been sitting on the sidelines for too long, and I'm ready to play the game. (laughs) Do you think she may have regretted this decision? (laughs) How could she know what was going to happen next? I know. I know. Spoiler alert. Yeah. It doesn't go so well. Yeah. But <laughs> at this moment, I think that she may look back in her life and be like, damn, I shouldn't have. Maybe I should have just uh, been his mistress. Have. Just slept with him. <laughs> so Henry goes to Cromwell and he's like, hey, I want to get to know this uh, Seymour girl. But um, she won't see me unless someone in her family is there to chaperone. It's like her uh, virginity belt. Yes. Like, <laughs> I need to make sure that... Her mom- chastity belt. Chastity belt, yes. that's what it is. Mommy and Daddy are here to look after me. And Cromwell's like, well, her brother can have my rooms then. And, y'all, this is a big fucking deal because Cromwell's rooms are, like, conjoined to the king's room. Yeah, so Jane's brother is basically right next door to the king. Yeah, he has, like, constant access to the king now. And this is called moving on up. To the king's king's room. Yeah, to the king's side, exactly. (laughs) And so she's fully aware at this point that... I'm making connections for my family. Yeah. I am moving on up. <laughs> and me, 
plain Jane. They are going to owe me. I'm the one that he's after. So I think she was, um, a lot of people like to play her, like describe her as being a pawn here. I don't, I think she knew exactly what she was doing. Yeah, she had seen it. Well, Anne had done the same thing. Thing. Yeah, yeah. And so she had seen this same thing happen before. So Except she's like, Anne Boleyn and Henry's thing went on for like seven years. So this is just going to be the pretty much the same story, but on fast forward. Yeah, really, yeah. really. And everyone in court knew that the Seymours were on the up and up, including it, Anne Boleyn. And I think that Jay knew that Anne knew and very, very lightly rubbed it in Anne's face. What I'm getting at is that I think she knew more than people thought she did. And here's yeah. here's a story I like to use as an example. The story of the locket. So Henry gave Jane a locket with his picture in it, and she wore it loud and proud. And when Henry had been dating Anne, he had given her a locket as well with his portrait in it. Because, you know, he just basically took the same dating techniques that he used with yeah. Anne and just applied it to Jane. Yes. Uh, Lamo. So Jane, who was still a lady in waiting to Anne Boleyn at the time, she would wear this locket around court and play with it all the time, and open it up and look at his face and go, "He's ah. so dreamy." And then, like, I mean, she knew. She fucking knew. Like, you do not walk into the court of your employer twiddling a locket of their husband in yes. your hands, like. This girl did not came to play. She, she came was, to slay. <laughs> she was just as catty and cunning as everyone else at the Tudor court. Yeah. And so Anne sees her playing with her locket like Jane wanted her to. And Anne's like, hey, what's that? And Jane acts all dumb like, oh, um, nothing. <laughs> so the story goes that Anne reaches across and rips the necklace off of Jane's neck and hurts her finger, which... Highly possible, because I would do the same shit. (laughs) Yes. But I also think that's 100% what Jane wanted to happen. She wanted to make Anne lose her temper in front of everybody and look like this hothead that everyone always said she was. Oh my god, she's off her rocker. She's crazy. Anne is a witch. She's a witch. While making herself (laughs) look like the victim of an Uh... evil queen. She knew the optics. Mm-hmm. Because if she was as quiet and demure and pious as everyone says she was, she wouldn't have taken a locket from a married man. Boom. Mic drop. Mic drop. So, so that was just a ploy. And, um, I mean, it worked because everyone was like, oh, Anne's losing her grip on reality. Yeah, everyone at court at this point knows that Anne's losing her grip, and Henry's got this new boo thing over here. So, um, everyone at court knew, yeah, knew she, he had this new boo thing over here, as he said, which is lovely. Um, <laughs> Chapuis wrote of her. He wasn't, he wasn't impressed at first. He, <laughs> yeah, at first when he wasn't persuaded by money. Yeah, and um, he wrote, um, she's of middle stature and no great beauty. She's not a woman of great wit, but she may have some understanding. It is said that she is proud and haughty, but she does have affection towards the Princess Mary. So he's like, he's not painting a great picture of her. On top of like her not being a great beauty, he's also saying that she's um, a snob. Yeah, but he doesn't pay anybody that's after Henry at this point, or Henry's after them. Yeah. He doesn't paint anybody in a good light. But he does note like, she does have affection for the Princess Mary. Yeah. So I'm not going to write her off just yet. I kind of want to fast forward through the arrest and trial of Anne Boleyn at this point because we've already covered it and you can listen to that episode. And also because it makes me sad. Yeah, but mainly because James is mostly MIA for it. But for continuity's sake, let's just do a... Quick Quick recap. recap. Uh, Henry decides Anne is out, so he tells Cromwell to start an investigation. And at the same time, he's like, Jane Boo, I need you to get out of court for a while. Because he doesn't want anybody to associate Jane. He did the same thing with Anne. Yeah. Like whenever Catherine of Aragon was on trial, like for them to get a divorce. Manipulative. Like they don't have anything to do with this. He's got one playbook. (laughs) (laughs) He's got... And he's just doing the exact same things. Over and over and over. But y'all, at this time, I honestly do not think Jane Seymour knew that Anne Boleyn was going to have her head cut off. Nope. I mean, really, no. He, She thought, oh, he's just going to put her aside. Just like he did Catherine. Yeah. Same she, thing. Um, Nobody. 
nobody expected that it was going to end up with like what eight people getting executed like bananas bananas this B- this court is bananas B A N A N A S. this court is bananas okay katie all right <laughs> so um yeah so i think jane is yeah like we said just gonna have Anne put aside so she's just like awesome i'm gonna head out and she goes and hangs out at nikki c's house for a little while while Henry does the dirty work in London. Literally dirty work. And um, it's sort of understood between the two of them that once Anne is put aside, that Henry's going to propose. But she didn't know put aside meant her head would be chopped off. Her head would be put aside from her body. (laughs) Yeah. So Jane is off chilling, chilling, chilling in the country. But we have no idea what her response was when she found out when the queen was sentenced to death. But if it was me, I would have been like, (laughs) what the fuck? I have agreed to marry a man that just executed his wife. Yeah, I think I think she had an aha moment, as Oprah would say, and was like, Oh, I need to learn from Anne and not be just like that J- because I could have my head copped off. She, I mean, I... Oh, that is like Nightmare City. Like, I would have <laughs> never... Be, I've never been in a relationship that started with us cheating because I, I feel like the whole time I would just be nervous of like, oh, well, he's going to cheat on me. I don't think I could ever then go on to be in a relationship with somebody that just cut <laughs> his ex's head off. <laughs> Oh because then I would be like, oh, what if he cuts my head off? <laughs> I mean, these are not easy things so to So I just comprehend. imagine <laughs> she must have been like, but like, what can she do? Like, she's already, tell the king, <laughs> no, I'm not going to marry you now. After you signed up for this shit. And I mean, just... <laughs> she's too deep in it. I, feel I like... can just imagine her getting the letter or somebody being like, hey, they chopped Anne Boleyn's head off and her being like, G-g-g-g-g-g-g. it'd be like, <laughs> Say what now? Uh, oh, and her brother and also all these other guys. Because she uh, was serving at Anne's court when all these supposed, um, you know, like treasonous charges happened. She probably knew very well that Anne Boleyn was not fucking all these guys. Yeah. No, and so she, she knew. She, she knew, knew that Anne Boleyn was not fucking all these guys. So she was just like, fuck. I mean, we're assuming. We don't know. Maybe she was an absolute heartless bitch. And she was like, sweet. (laughs) (laughs) This is awesome. But it just doesn't seem to jive with the rest of her character. No, it doesn't. I mean, I think she was more manipulative than we give her credit for. But I don't think she was a monster. But can you imagine, like, being Jane and then Henry lobbing his ex-wife's head off and then... One day later. Kneeling on one knee one day later, being like, will you marry me? And it's like, fuck. If I I say no, I'm dead. If I say yes, I'm dead. (laughs) I mean, first of all, she couldn't say no. Her family... Hashtag dead. There was no... She couldn't... In no possible scenario could she have said no. Her family would have disowned her. Her, like... So, yeah, fine, I'll be queen. Please don't chop, chop my head off. And then 10 days later, in a private ceremony, they were married like a Henry VIII would in his private little fucking ceremonies. And if you're it, thinking that was a rush, so is ha- all of England. Like he tried, <laughs> he tried to actually not make it public for a while because um, it looks tacky. And it is tacky. It, and- lo- it looks like it. And but you know word got out because no one could fucking keep a secret. Obviously not, like especially with something so scandalous. And it looked horrible because it was like all these people who had been like saying, "Well, if the king wants to execute Anne Boleyn, she must actually be guilty," are now being like, "Oh no, he he just wanted to get rid of her." To marry this other chick. Yeah. It didn't look good. And some people thought it was because Jane was actually pregnant at the time. I fucking love this theory. You are subscribed. I I don't know that I'm subscribed, but I like, but I like, (laughs) like, um, Alison Weir has this, uh, fiction, like a novel about Jane Boleyn and she, or Jane Boleyn, um, there is a Jane Boleyn, but that's not who we're talking about, about Jane Seymour. 
that she was pregnant. I mean, there's a lot of things that back it up, that she had slept with the king before they got married and that she was pregnant when they got married. And um, I think it makes great entertainment value. But I don't know if I believe that it definitely happened. Um, it makes for an interesting theory, though. It makes her um, really interesting. But um, there's no evidence for this really, that she was already pregnant by when they got married. But one, it would explain the quick marriage. Shotgun wedding. It would also explain why Henry wanted to marry this plain Jane who brought absolutely nothing to the table. Yep. She was... Because, you know, now that he's free of Anne Boleyn, he could have married somebody that was going to really bring, like, money or land or alliances. And... She's a nobody. I mean, literally everybody in the country besides the people that were at court and knew her were like, wait, who? Who Who did? What's Wolf Hall? Who is? What is a Seymour? You know, like what? So um, the Spanish ambassador Chapuy had also said when they got married, because he is a catty bitch and I'm here for it. (laughs) (laughs) He said that, you know. There is no way that she could have been at the English court for all this he, all these years and remained a virgin. And he said, when the king decides he wants to put this one aside too, he's not going to have any problem finding people to witness to that she had slept with other guys before him. Chapuis is he, shady bitch. He is <laughs> shady and I love him. I know. Anyway, she was announced as queen on June the 4th and everyone in England was like, who? What? Who is oh. this queen that kinda you like, say? Kind of like when uh, hashtag poor baby Jane, Jane Grey became queen. Yeah. It was like, kind of the same thing. Everyone was like, who? <laughs> 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 what now? <laughs> <laughs> She didn't actually receive a, a coronation, though. Mm. Catherine had been coronated along with Henry, and then Anne got one right away, and Jane never had one. The official reason is because the plague was, like, hopping, hopping in London. Like diseases, and hopping, hopping. Yeah. <laughs> and they didn't want to risk, you know, catching the plague. <laughs> yeah. Um, but many people, more cynical people, say that he wasn't going to officially crown her until she had given him an heir and a spare. What a dickwad. Yeah. All right, day one. Henry's like, say, girl, you pregnant yet? Like, we can say Henry was in love with her until we're blue in the face, and I'm sure he was in his weird Caligula way. But I think he was really more in love with how fertile her family was. Yeah, he was like... It, Your mama's a fertile myrtle. Love you, girl. You like, got, yeah. Literally just... There was no pretense. She was there to give him children. Yep. There was absolutely... He never pretended like that wasn't her main duty. Um, you know. He made it very clear from day one. And being that his previous queen just got her head lobbed off because she didn't have any sons. <laughs> no pressure or anything. No pressure. Uh, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So Jane as a queen. Oh, and I guess... Trying not to get her head cut off. Yeah. I guess we kind of... If she had been pregnant at the time of their marriage, she would have obviously had lost that baby. Yeah. It was a miscarriage. Yeah. Yes. But, um, so yeah. Jane is queen. Baby making aside, she decided, I'm going to have a different kind of queenship to Anne Boleyn in every way. She's just being her uh, opposite. I, she's like, I'm not going to get involved in politics. Not going to do it. Nope. I'm going to be the exact opposite of Anne. And Anne had been really into French fashion. So Jane was like, nope. I'm into English fashion. And like, so during Anne's reign, they wore the French hoods. Which, which I- is like a fascinator with like a fabulous hood. Yeah. And it's um kind of, you see some of the hair. You can push it yeah, back a little bit. It's got a little bit and of... And it's... um. I mean, I think all of the headwear that women had to wear back then was hideous. But this is, like, at least a little less hideous. And she was like, and so everybody has to wear an English gable. All my ladies have to wear English gables. So if you don't know what the fuck that means, Google it real quick. It looks like you have, like, a birdhouse on your head. Yeah. Like, it is so fucking ugly. It's like this triangular-shaped extravaganza it's It's disgusting yeah i am down with the french hood yeah (laughs) but she she just wanted to completely separate herself from anything anne boleyn and so fashion was part of that 
Um, so Jane famously wanted to make amends between Henry and his daughter with Catherine of Aragon, uh, Princess Mary. Princess Mary was 20 at this point and just... You know, she was stubborn, just like her father. And her mother. And the king and her had been at odds with each other for fucking years. Yes. And Jane went to Henry and was like, okay, look, I think you should put Mary back into the line of succession. And maybe this would be a good PR stunt for you. He really needed some good PR. Yeah, after killing your ex-wife. And, you know, (laughs) making everybody turn their back on their religion. (laughs) The the, the famous destroyer of religion. Wife killer. (laughs) And so I think Jane probably presented it like, um, you know, the people of the land will really love it. But I think she was really trying... I think now that she realized she had a little bit of power, she was like, I want to do right by Catherine. And and she wanted to be like, dude, this is your fucking daughter. Yeah. And also, (laughs) this is your fucking daughter. And she's living off in Yield, Dusty Castle, and like, the people love her. And Henry blew Jane off and straight up told her, you should be worried about our children and not the kids I've had with other women. Because Henry, Henry, I feel like Henry could give a shit about Jane's opinion. Fragile dick energy. I think he was looking at it like... I am not going to take any counsel from you until you've given me that air and that spare. But Jane was like a dog with a bone on Mary. We know she wrote a a letter to Mary, and we don't know exactly what it said, but it was something like, hey, you had a shitty relationship with your last stepmom, but I, you know, don't want us to fight like uh, uh, they did, but I really want to get to know you if you just bend a little to your dad's will I bet you can get him to let you back at court and your life could be awesome again and we could be totally awesome because she probably met Mary at least once or twice while she was in the service of Catherine yeah so they probably already at least it's not like a complete stranger writing Mm. you a letter it's like your mom's old maid like old maid (laughs) your mom's previous maid of honor like um, she's like what 26 at the time like (laughs) uh, a few months later mary and henry were reconciled and um mary was allowed to come back to court and treated how she deserved to be treated and there is while the letter from jane does not survive there's a letter from Mary that survives to James um, thanking her for the good advice. And people recognize this was Jane's doing. <laughs> yes, and it was amazing PR. Like, she was such a popular queen after that with um, just, like, the common people. Because, the com- I mean, thinking about the religious, like... Aspect. war yeah. at that time like she stepped outside of it and was like hey this is your daughter it's above religion yeah you and know, now calm down and now suddenly Chapuis um <laughs> went from being like no great beauty probably not a virgin blah 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 to being like to calling her the pacific because she she was a pacifier like she made uh she brought peace and he, he, I don't, he wasn't wrong. She, that was a huge thing, getting Mary and Henry to reconcile. And um, history's eye pretty much gives Jane, like, full credit for All it. All the credit, yeah. yeah. She did, she did do good. And a Girl. lot of people viewed her as a peacekeeper and maybe the only person that could keep the increasingly tyrannical king at, you know, at bay a little bit. So, uh, let's talk about the Pilgrimage of Grace. But just a little bit. Because that's the Patreon episode Yeah, the Patreon this. episode for this one is going to be on the Pilgrimage of Grace, so we're not going to dive into it too much. Um, we're not going to go that deep. We're going to go deeper in our Patreon episode. Mm, so, that's what she said. Basically, there was a huge uprising in the north uh, between England. because uh, Between England. Um, between in, England and England. And England. Yeah. Because there was dis- dissolution of the monasteries. And Henry's about to come down on these rebels super hardcore, y'all. So Jane decides in a public court... To throw herself at the knees of King Henry in front of everybody and is like, 
please show mercy on your subjects. Please. So this isn't as crazy as it sounds. um, Because us knowing how history went is like, why would you try to um, go against the king who is a crazy in front of everybody. But queens before this have all had subjects who have advised her to throw yourself in front of the king yeah. at this moment. So in like medieval time especially. So like if we think back to more like um, William the Conqueror or something like that. If he maybe was supposed to like show like a huge sign of wrath on some people but like maybe he didn't actually want to do it but he's like but if I don't do it I'm gonna look like a fucking pussy his advisors would go to his wife and be like hey um it's a pardon it's It's like like it's a pardon they would be like hey the king doesn't want to look like a a pussy so why don't you go and beg for mercy in front of everybody, and then he'll do it, he'll show mercy out of love for you. Yeah, make it at this and big so that spectacle. Was, so that was a really common thing. Um, so she is just trying to play her part that she thinks the king wants her to play. But the thing is, she wasn't, because uh, Catherine of Aragon did this to Henry several times, but she, Catherine of Aragon was raised at court. Catherine of Aragon knew how this game was played. Jane Seymour was trying to be a player in this game, but she didn't have any advisors. She didn't know that you're, the king's, um, you know, advisor was supposed to come up and tell her when to do this. Yeah. She thought queens just did it when, like, they were they're passionate. conscious. But, yeah. They were passionate. She didn't know what the fuck she was doing, and nobody was telling her what the fuck to do. And so, so she made a huge ass of herself in front of King Henry. Everybody. And so basically she's on her knees being like, please show mercy to the people in the north. And he is like, get up. And she's like, oh. Uh. And he reminds her of what happened to his last wife. <laughs> that gives me the shivers, girl. I. The uh. thing, okay, so here's the thing. With Henry VIII. He's not looking for a co-ruler. He's not looking... Like, Catherine no. of Aragon, they were coronated together. They were co-rulers. His mo- Her mama was a strong ally, and he was trying to make an alliance. He's and not he looking was doing- for that. Nope. He's not looking for a wife to challenge him mentally. Like Anne Boleyn. Like Anne Boleyn did. That didn't end well. He's not looking for that. <laughs> he is looking... He is looking for a wife to make him a son... And to sit there and look pretty. So for her, Jane, to sit in front of the entire court with him, Henry. And challenge him like that. He's he's like, you got me fucked up, girl. And so whenever he reminds her, like, hey, you remember what happened to my last queen that meddled in my affairs? Shut her the fuck up. I would. I would zip my mouth I, shut. I am shooketh just thinking about it. Like... He's no basically more. reminded her, I can have you executed at any moment. So, no more having fun, girl. Like, no more, <laughs> I don't need any more advice from you. Um, can, yeah, just, I'm terrified just thinking about it. So, needless to say, she never tried to be part of politics again. But guess what? That's okay, because in 1537 of January, Jane is a pregger. Finally pregnant! And I say finally because it had been like eight months since they were married, and I do think that she started to worry about her not getting pregnant with him because maybe she would get her head cut off. Yeah, she was like um, maybe starting to worry, like, oh, maybe I'm not <laughs> fertile, um... Unless, unless you buy into that she was pregnant when they got married and then had a miscarriage, because um, then that would kind of fit this timeline, because it takes you a few months before you can get pregnant again after a miscarriage. But anyway, she's yeah. pregnant now, and there are going to be celebrations in All London. All throughout London, Bish. the wine, the mead, everything is flowing. They had like the baby popping ceremonies where, is this a boy or a girl? And they're like, it's a boy. Like they Except had, they didn't know. Because. Yeah, but well, they had <laughs> astrologers come out, which at the time was... Um, like, that was a big fucking deal. And the astrologers, of course, all were like, we definitely see a boy in the future. Because <laughs> they, they don't want to get their head cut off. Yeah. And then Henry did what he always did when all his wives were pregnant. 
he started to sleep around. Yes. <laughs> it's kind of his thing. <laughs> Unlike with Anne and Catherine, um, when they were pregnant, we kind of know who his main mistresses were. Um, but his anybody he would have fucked around with during Jane's pregnancy has not made the history books. But there are several stories of him like leaving their bedroom and going off and sneaking out to get that pee. Um, Jane couldn't have been thrilled with this, but she wasn't about to make an ordeal about it. You no, saw bitch. Anne Boleyn made ordeals about it, and you saw what happened there. That big sexy mouth. That big sexy mouth. <laughs> Again, she was like looking, okay, well, I get, she's like, what would Catherine of Aragon do? And everything. And Catherine of Aragon quietly. WWCA. Yeah. (laughs) WWCAD. What would Catherine of Aragon do? She's like, Catherine of Aragon would have just suffered in silence, and that's what I'm going to (laughs) do. But Jane, I mean, she was treated like she was going to break during her like she, uh, during her pregnancy she she had a t-shirt that says stay calm and make babies stay yes <laughs> absolutely stay calm and make babies she was not i say she wasn't allowed to do anything strenuous but i think she was just she didn't want to risk losing this baby either so basically for 9 months she just sat around and sewed. With the shirt on that said, said stay, stay calm, calm and, she's, and she's, make babies. She sewed little tea cozies that said stay calm and make babies. Um, so yeah, the next nine months are pretty uneventful for this story. And then in October, she goes into labor. And she is in labor for two days and three nights. Which sounds like hell. Jesus Christ, can you imagine? I would be like, get the this spawn of a leech Satan out of me. I I'm so happy we live in the future. <laughs> yeah, C sections are a thing now. I mean they did C sections back then, but you did not survive. Death. Some people some people claim that she had a C section, but no, she wouldn't have she because she did live, spoiler alert, a little bit longer. And if they had done a C section, she would have been dead by the time they pulled the baby out, you know? So Two days, three nights later, on October 12th, 1537, England finally fucking has a prince of goddamn Wales. And Jane had a healthy baby boy, and the country rejoiced. It's like when England wins the soccer cup. The soccer cup? (laughs) Soccer sports. Soccer sports cup. That's exactly what it's called. (laughs) Uh, Yes. Yes. Are you going for the World Cup there? Is that what you're trying to get? Or just soccer cup? Soccer. Soccer sports, sports cup. Anyway. I'm sporting so hard. So, guys. yes. No. So, <laughs> Prince Edward's is... Prince Edward is 100% the, the soccer sports cup that Henry has been waiting for. And he's born on Edward's Day, so he is... St. Edward's Day? So, he's Edward. So, he's Edward. Yeah, he's born on Saint Ed- the Feast of St. Edward, so he is... They name him Edward, because... I mean, you gotta remember, um, Henry was incredibly superstitious. Yeah. So he, he was, was like, well, this is a sign from God, and this is, we're gonna, God wants us to name it. Which is very Catholic of him. I know. <laughs> it's very, very Catholic of him. Anyway. But Jane survived uh, childbirth at this. Yeah, and it, she was expected to make a full recovery. The day after birth, I mean, she stayed in bed, but she, like, she saw people like people came in and, and they like, wrote letters to make sure that and like she like hosted out. people like ambassadors came in and sat with her for 20 minutes here so and she there. may be a little bit sleepy but she fine girl. She, she i'm sure she's fucking exhausted but yeah <laughs> if she was not i just pushed a fucking watermelon out of my well yeah it yeah. took me three days to do it <laughs> yeah i would be pissed but, i would not be as eloquent and um edward was christened and um I don't think she attended the christening, but I think that, I don't think she was sick yet. I think that was just normal. I think mothers hadn't been churched yet, which is a disgusting thing. It's basically, (laughs) after you have your baby, you have to like basically stay in quarantine for a little bit, and then you go to mass and you're forgiven for your sin of filth. Of having a baby from your husband? Yeah, it's called being churched. Yes. Because... I am sick. Sickened. Isn't that disgusting? In not a positive so, way. So a lot. Are you ever sickened in a positive well, way? Well, you can be sickening, which is like a positive thing. Like anyway. I'm sickening. I look sickening. But this is like. Yeah. No, it's disgusting. Church. A lot of mothers didn't attend their children's uh, christening because they hadn't been churched yet. 
Because they were filthy from... Don't take me to church. (laughs) Anyway, so Jane didn't attend that, and a lot of people say because she was so sick, but no, she wasn't sick yet. Um, She was just filthy from, you know, doing what everybody told her she needed to do. (laughs) Having children. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, so um, about a week goes by, and she's like, she's fine. She's on top of the world. She's had, like, a baby son from the king. She's done. She had one job, and she did it. But then about a weekend, girl, she gets the shits. She gets diarrhea. <laughs> diarrhea. And like, but like a serious, serious case of it. Explosive. And there are lots of theories about what caused Jane's um, downward spiral in health. But I think this mixed with, and this is gross, but like when you're in labor for that long, things down there are going to tear. Okay, and so let's let's get scientific. And yeah. they're not going to be completely healed yet. And then you're having diarrhea on top of it. And then on top of it, the 16th century, they don't know anything about Lack hygiene. Lack of medicine. <laughs> um, so things are getting into open sores. <laughs> that shouldn't be. <laughs> so that's one theory. <laughs> that's one theory of what happened. Another thing that, um, it's called childbed fever. A lot of women would... Oh, it's the placenta gets stuck yeah, inside. Yeah, because they did, cause like now we know that after you have the baby, you have to get all the afterbirth, afterbirth out. And back then they didn't necessarily know that. So the placenta, like part of the placenta might still be up the, in there just rotting and causing infection. Oh my gosh, this sounds like... I would have diarrhea for weeks I mean, Just based on this. So I mean, I get it. There's there's several theories on what made her sick, but whatever it was caused childbirth. It, well, yes. I mean, <laughs> it, was, it would have not happened if she hadn't been in labor for a million days. But whatever caused it, Jane Seymour passed away two weeks after the birth of her son, Edward. So not only was the country in mourning... Henry the Eighth is in mourning. It's the it's the first time Tommy Crommy is in mourning. Everybody's in mourning, <laughs> but like I, it's so bizarre to think Henry had. Spoiler alert for the future: he had six wives, and um, <laughs> that's not much of a spoiler. <laughs> two of them he had executed. One when she died, he wore fucking yellow, and the other two outlived him. This is his only wife out of six that he mourned when she died. And I don't, I think Henry was a little bit of a man child when it came to his emotions. And I um, don't, a man child in general. I don't think <laughs> he knew how to process this or process anything. anything. <laughs> and the country didn't know what to do. Her funeral is the first queen's funeral. To happen since Henry's mother, Elizabeth of York, died. Yeah, so they had to, like, A do, long time ago. Like, they 20 had to over, do, over 20-something years ago. They had to do, like, special research on it to what figure to do out for a how, queen's uh, funeral. how to... Like, they Googled what to do when mom dies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, literally. It was a huge to-do. It was, yes. It was a huge to-do. So Mary, his first daughter, was the chief mourner. Which and is a thing. And, Which is an actual job title. <laughs> and 28 of the ladies-in-waiting that followed her to her his funeral, all dressed in mourning. This and it was, was it was 28 women, each one, to signify a year of her life. Though some people say it was 29 women, so she was 28 or 29 when she so died. So, s- symbolism. Yay. Yes. <laughs> Henry didn't attend the funeral. This is common, though. We've talked about this in other... Um, episodes where... So that Jane was the highest ranking person there. Yes. So the king didn't show up because he didn't want to be bigger than she was. But also I think he was in... I think he also didn't want his country to see him crying. He was in legitimate mourning. Which we don't get a lot of instances where you're like, oh, Henry VIII, I feel sorry for him. He was expressing his fragile dick energy. Well, I mean, it's not fragile dick energy to mourn your wife when she dies. Which one? This one. <laughs> this one, Nathan. The one we've been talking about for the last hour and a half. But, sorry, we talked about three other ones. Yeah, true. <laughs> but he was actually he was in super mourning. He wore black for three months. And I think also maybe he was feeling a little bit cursed. Because it's like, again, he was very superstitious. And now it's like, 
I finally get a son, and the wife that gave it to me died. Is dead. And maybe feeling a little bad for, you know, threatening to kill her in front of the court. Maybe he's getting a little bit of religious karma yeah. coming back at him right now. So let's talk legacy before we wrap this up. So Jane goes down as this super boring wife in history, but she's the one that Henry is buried next to. He's, she's the only one that he views as his legitimate wife. Out of all six of them. And it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. I honestly think that if she had been given the chance to be queen longer, once she gave him the sons, she could have done so much good. Because just in her like year that she was queen, she reconciled Henry and Mary. Mm-hmm. I bet she could have done so much reconciled good. Reconciled Anne and Elizabeth. Like, well, Anne is dead. Um, you mean Henry and Elizabeth? <laughs> Put up. Like, um, relationship. There's, I just feel like if she would have been given longer to rule, she would have been... First of all, we'd know more about her life. Yeah. And secondly, I think she could have done a lot of good. Even though I don't think she's as boring. No. I think she might be a little bit more manipulative than people think. I do think at her heart, though... She wanted to make the country a better place. She wanted to make Henry a better person. And I'm I wish she would have been given the chance to do that. Yeah. Cheers. To, cheers to Jane. 